Thank you so much. Okay, we're starting a new study tonight. Second Thessalonians. And really it does come right behind First Thessalonians, so there's a lot of dovetailing in. It fits together and you kind of study together is what you're gonna do. Okay, uh, I did put this up on the board. Your present tribulation is not the great tribulation. And that's really what Paul's telling them in this in this lesson today and the, this whole uh, little letter, which it only has three chapters. So let's look at it. We're going to be looking at the first 12 <clears throat> verses, which is the first chapter. <clears throat> and let's look at the introduction. This will save me if I can just stay on track and not get off. Uh, the occasion of this is a misunderstanding among the Thessalonians regarding the coming of Christ for his own, that's the rapture, and the day of the Lord. Those are two different things. We should distinguish those things. And so when you blend those things, you can get real confusion. And that's what we see happening today everywhere. There's no distinction made between those two things. And there's a lot of things that have to, you have to divide out. For, in, for instance, and I'm getting off. For instance, when Paul, when Paul wrote about the last days in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, he's talking about the last days you know, of the church. Right before the rapture, that's Second Timothy chapter three, verse one and following. But if if Timothy, but if Peter is talking about the last days, he's talking about the last days right here of the tribulation, because he has the last days. The fervent heat is burning up, and and the earth is burning burning away. New heavens and a new earth. That's the last day, and he'll talk about what's going to happen before this time right here. Paul talks about what's going to happen right here before this time. Okay? And so we should try to, we have to, we have to divide things up. It's different. So here, this is uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, remember, 13 through 18. And then uh, over here is the day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. We, you know, we studied this uh, in 1 Thessalonians. The day of the Lord covers the tribulation, which is the beginning part of the day of the Lord. A day of darkness, a day of wrath. Remember, we talked about that. All the prophets talked about this. All the prophets talked about this. And then the day of the Lord also includes the coming back of Jesus. And then the judgments that are surrounding his coming back. Because he judged, there's judgments that take place here. And then the, the day of the Lord also includes the kingdom of God. There's that crown. There's the glory that follows the suffering. Over here is way over here is the suffering of Christ. You know? That's the way it looks. And that is a little bit of a dispensational view, but that's the only one that makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> All that other is they spiritualize. When you spiritualize, you tell spiritual lies. Okay, so let's go. So they, they had, you, have, you can't just throw those together. In other words, if Peter says the last days looks like this, Paul says the last days look like this. We're talking about the last days of this time in which we live. When you make that distinction, it really helps out a whole lot. Uh, so there was confusion. And uh, so because of these believers, because they were persecuted severely, now it's, it's, I'll get into what persecution really means. Persecution really means it was an organized effort on the part of some to directly target these people, to silence them or to even destroy them, to, to treat them in a violent way or dispossession, and, and on and on. Like it's happening in the world today because believers are targeted too, uh, it, like in Nigeria and other places that I've followed. All over the world, there's, there's people who are being targeted because of their faith. So that's what persecution always means. And so uh, they were persecuted severely, and so they erroneously concluded that the day of the Lord had already arrived. Because the day of the Lord is a real hard time. It's a bad time. It's a dark time. A day of wrath. A hard time for even believers during this time. It's going to be great tribulations. Great called great tribulation in Matthew 24. And so it's easy. If you were in the midst of that, what they were in, you might think it's the day of the Lord too. Maybe you think, okay, I'm not going to be delivered because I'm already in the middle of it. You know? And so I did put up there 
your present tribulation, whatever you're going through, is not the great tribulation. Although, you know, believers go through some very ter terrible things. But what I've learned in this lesson, there's a difference between persecution and tribulation. That's two different things. Persecution, again, <clears throat> is a direct... Look, in fact, uh, go down there and on the outline to uh, number eight, that sub point eight down there. Let me read it. Persecution of the Thessalonians was an organized effort to harass them. Persecution is an effort designed to oppress. Paul himself was persecuted by Jews and Gentiles. People knew of Paul, and they organized efforts to try to destroy him. Uh, to, you know, through physical violence or discredit him through, his, through words or uh, just trying to make him look foolish. This was organized persecution. This was of the same quality that Jesus faced. You remember, Jesus faced organized, he was targeted. And that's what we mean by persecution. You're targeted by somebody with a design to destroy you. Now, of course, as believers... Satan targets us too, of course. But in the world, there's organized uh, people who do persecute other people because of their faith. And then uh, it is what we can expect in our own day from an anti-God world system. Okay, now, going back up there then uh, at the introduction, this letter that we're about to study is Paul's assurance to these believers that their present tribulation is not the great tribulation. All right, we'll see that. Uh, the condition of the church at the time when he wrote this, and incidentally, uh, you know, the, the commentators vary. They say, well, it was a short time after he wrote the first letter, he wrote the second letter. And then they, I, I read, I guess in our uh, teacher's book, maybe a year, maybe two years in there in between. But we can say more, pretty recent because he's answering to some of the same issues. So he wrote the second. So what's going on when he writes the second letter? So the condition of that church at the time of the second letter, here it is. A few were still unruly. <coughs> we'll get to that when we get to 2 Thessalonians 3. Uh, they were under persecution still. He mentions that. And they were still not, some of them were still not working. Uh, you know, and he got down to chapter 3. He said, if you don't work, <coughs> You don't eat. You remember? Uh, that's in one of those fam famous passages. In fact, you could apply that to so many problems that people have today, and it would solve so many problems. Uh, teenage problems, children's problems, all kinds of problems, social problems. Uh, people have to take responsibility for their behavior. And there are consequences, uh, and there are rewards. You know? And so that's what, uh, you'll see how practical Paul's advice, not advice, his commands are. Paul doesn't give advice. He gives commands. He, he does. He gives commands. He said, I'm sure that you will do as I commanded you to do. You know? And go, well, that wouldn't go over too good today in the churches, would it? Uh, that's why Paul is ignored in the churches. I just have to tell you. Uh, we're, we're preaching all kinds of things. You know, I looked at, uh, I'm really getting off. I got, this week I got, the Billy Graham uh, magazine. Some of you might get that. The Decision magazine. Remember, they say, oh, well, they got the new one. And, uh, you know, Franklin Graham had an article. And he said this. It's, in fact, it's on the front page of that magazine. It says, if you follow the progressive Christian gospel, it will lead you to hell. The progressive Christian doctrine. Pro progression Christianity denies almost all the fundamental things that we believe in. And yet it, it, it's gone out there, it's presented as Christian, everybody loves it, the world loves it, you're accepted in the world if you follow that progressive kind of thinking. And yet it's, it's so far removed. And so that's why even at the very beginning, even Jesus, at early as, early as Jesus, he, he warned his disciples of false teachers that would come, up, come in. And of course after Jesus, uh, the apostles warned and so it didn't take long. It did not take long for false teaching to come in. It's not just something in the 21st century. In the very first century, false teachers had already come in. So huge, all kinds of theological false teachers 
And so we need, we need to rightly divide the Word of God and understand what's happening. And so that's one of the conditions in the church. They had misapplied doctrine, and uh, they had these false teachers. And some of the false teachers apparently, and I have to use the word apparently, had come in and said to them, you, you're in, we're in the day of the Lord. And that would have confused them because Paul did not say that. He never said that. He, he never said that. He would not have taught them that. I mean, that is true that some people today have, have said that we're, that the church is going to go into the day of the Lord. And uh, they will have, uh, I don't know how, why I have this space here, but they, they, they'll have the church maybe being raptured midpoint. Instead of the church being raptured, say, before the tribulation, they'll say, well, the church is going to go into the tribulation and then be raptured before the, the what's called the great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years. And then some people have it so that the church is raptured right here at the second advent. You know, So it's either going to be here, here, or here, and this is our position. I think that's the biblical position. I like that position. <laughs> yeah, we do like that position better, for sure. But that doesn't mean that we will not have tribulation. But it's not the great tribulation. You know, our, our forefathers, World War I, World War II, they went through some terrible times. And then times when you had plagues that killed so many people, far more than what we've uh, experienced with COVID-19. COVID-19 was nothing compared to some other things that happened in human history. And so there it is. And so the outline looks like this. You know, that outline uh, came from Unger's Bible Handbook, so did part of that introduction. I, get, I put an asterisk there to show you if I brought something out of a text. Uh, Unger's uh, just, just outline is very simple. The coming of the Lord and the comfort in present persecutions, chapter 1. And then uh, the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord, chapter 2. And then the coming of the Lord and practical Christian living, chapter 3. All right, so that's what we'll be looking at in the next four or five uh, sessions that we have to cover this. All right, let's start with the greeting. Uh, the greeting, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, all right? Paul includes his companions as those at, you know behind this letter. Paul is the one writing, but he's concluding them because they're with him. And it's unto the church of the Thessalonians. And we studied that when we took 1 Thessalonians. You remember from Acts how uh, Paul went in, the church was established. Not very long, they were running, persecuting Paul. He had to leave town, you know, the whole thing about that. So the introduction to 1 Thessalonians would cover our introduction about the city of Thessalonica and the time that it was written around 50, 51, 52 uh, A.D. And so it's to that church. We're talking, the church of the Thessalonians identifies a local church. And we know that there's a universal church, which is the one body of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 maybe? There's one, remember he says there's one body, you know. And so that's the universal church. This is a local church. All right, so that's the only thing we ever see is the local church. We don't, nobody's ever pastored in a universal church. We have pastors for local churches. Uh, so the local church, and notice this though, and we usually, you know, run over this and we don't think about it, but it's, that church is in God, in God our Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. That preposition includes both. God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And that's so important, isn't it? Because outside of Christ, there is no hope. Outside of Christ, there is no salvation. And so that's always important. You know, we have to understand we need to be in Christ. And uh, there's evidence of that. He will show that in just a moment. And then so in verse 2, he greets them, grace unto you and peace. Again, that grace and that peace, you mentioned that in your prayer, Lynn, that peace that we have is from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul always says, Lord, or he says, Lord Jesus, or he says, Lord Jesus.
Jesus Christ. I don't ever find him saying Jesus. He's not Jesus, he's Lord. And that'd be helpful if we kind of remember that because that's a different attitude. Lord is, the cognate for that is slave, servant. You know, the, the Lord, kurios is the Lord, word Lord. And then the cognate is doulos, that's a servant or a slave. And Paul considered himself the slave of the Lord, Jesus Christ, bond slave. And that's what we are. You know, we're members of his body. We don't have the headship. He is the head of the body. And so the head, what does your head do? Your head's kind of in charge of everything, <laughs> the function of the body. And so is the Lord. He's the head of the body, the body of Christ, which is the one body. All right, so we can go on. That's the greeting. So right there, and he wants to always let you know that that's the most important thing. You're in him. And then verse 3, he commends them. You know, when, when Paul wrote letters, he tried to, and this is true, isn't this true of the seven letters of the book of Revelation when Jesus dictates those letters to John? Uh, the first thing you try to do is compliment somebody. You tell them what they're doing that's right. And I think maybe there's one or two of those letters that wasn't a lot of complimentation. But here, Paul did, does this often. He, he'll compliment what's right. That's, that's a good thing to do, you know. Especially if you're going to get on to somebody, go ahead and compliment a whole lot and then get on that part you've got to get on to. And so he starts off with commendation. So Paul expresses thanksgiving. He says to them, we are bound. That means sort of like duty bound. It's the right thing to do. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Now, you know, some of the new translations say brethren and sister, <laughs> brothers and sisters. It's not meant to leave ladies out. It just means out from the same womb. Okay? And we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. That's an old English word. I know I stick with the old English, but what does that mean? It's fitting. It means fitting. It's fitting. It's fitting for me to give thanks. Because, now he tells us why he's giving thanks. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other abound, uh, each other aboundeth. Now the reason I use the old English, this is one of the reasons, okay? That little E-T-H there, right there? That, that's, that tells you that in the Greek text is continuous action, like the present tense. It's continuous action. You don't have to know the Greek. All you have to do is that old language. You've got an ETH, that means it's going on. So their faith is going on. Their faith is progressing. They have a progressive faith. And it's going on. They're growing in the faith. Ex excellency. Uh, um, and then uh, their love. Now, I even use the old English because of this word charity. It's the same word. It's the same. It's agape. But uh, it, it's the word for love. But sometimes it's translated love. Sometimes it's translated charity. And the reason is, look at this. The reason is, this word here often means this, a, a God-given kind of love. The love that God is giving, putting in you. The scripture says, His Spirit, uh, He says that the Holy Spirit has shed abroad in our hearts the love of God. So the love of God is the charity. And then when it's, when it's translated just the word love, often it's referring to your love moving toward the other believer. It's a, it's a God, it's a, it's a God pay love, but it's moving toward the other believer. And it's not just the, the one that's coming directly to you. So I like that. And so he's saying, and the charity of every one of you, all right, that's what God has put in you, toward each other abounds. You know, aboundeth. It keeps on abounding, okay? And so that's why he's giving thanks, because he notices two things, right? He notices their faith, and he notices their love. Let's just pause, pause for a moment think about that. Can, can, can people's true salvation, can it be evidence? Can spiritual life be evidence in a human being? And, and, and here we see it. He's commending something that obviously is observable. In other words, your faith growing is observable, and your love from God in your heart when you're sharing with other people, that's observable. And so he could commend that. Verse 4. Tommy, can I catch you off yes. for just a minute? Yes, sir. 
our Sunday school lesson, we're different, we're in a different thing than y'all, but we're doing root. And Boaz, his faith in God was observable to others. He, um, when he got to the field first in the second chapter of Ruth, he spoke to the workers. These are laborers. These are mm -hmm. servants. Some of them he owned, you know, kind of thing. But he spoke to them and gave them God's blessing when he got when he mm -hmm. got there. They were equals, you know, when he yeah. when he got there. He had a resting house built for them to get out of that intense heat uh, in Israel. They got a place where they could go to the shade. And then he fed them a meal. They had roasted grain, fed them a meal. Mm -hmm. the, the, the armies didn't even have, you know, they had to get mm -hmm. their own food. They had to, you know, the, you didn't have work, you, you didn't have the mm -hmm. masters providing them food with so that. So it's and, how you treat other people. And, and that is all about God working in him. The God yeah. of Jehovah God working in him. And he turned mm -hmm. that grace back that's on good. others. You know, it was observable in his life. His belief was right, observable, right. and that's where you said it always, all the way through. Even you know. Old Testament, yeah, it was observable. Yeah, because you know, uh, I don't want to get off. I don't have a lot of time. But Hebrews eleven, for by faith certain yeah, ones yeah, they that's, did that's these that's things. Right. By faith yeah. Noah yeah. did what he built an ark. Mm -hmm. That was an expression of his faith because God had revealed yeah. to him, and he was responding back to what God had revealed to him. But it is, I, I do think it has a lot to do with how we treat other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it might be somebody that could never help you, and yet what are you going to do? What's your attitude towards the poor yeah. and the weak? Yeah. How do you greet them? Yeah. How do you greet them? Yeah. You, you know, do they go away feeling like you, you know, that they're less than you, or you go away making them feel really great because you accept them as equals? Yeah. yeah. And, all right, so we got to get back. All right, so... <laughs> In verse 4 then, he says, so that, <clears throat> that means like so with the result that, we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. All right, we've got our uh, uh, missionary here tonight, Larry. Mm -hmm. And so Larry goes around to all the churches, and, and so Paul went around to all the churches. He could brag on the Thessalonians, you know, and he probably did. He's talking about the Thessalonians. They might have got tired of hearing it because <laughs> the Thessalonians was a model church. I got to tell you, the Jerusalem church was not the model church. The Thessalonians is called the model church. Sorry about that. You know, and Antioch was the seat of Christianity, not Jerusalem. Y'all know that. And believers were first called Christians in Antioch. That's where all the missionary activity came from. That was the headquarters. And that's very interesting too, but that's just history. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. And for what reason? For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So again, he brings up the idea of their faith, their, their patience and their faith in all the persecutions and tribulations that they endure. So now he's given it a context, their faith, their love, in the midst of persecutions and tribulations. Now persecution, we've already talked about that. And then the tribulations there has to do with any kind of trying event, like any kind of anxiety. You, we all have tribulation or tribulations because it could be anything that happens to you that, you know, that's a, it's a trial for you. It could be anything in nature. It could be other people, whatever. But persecution means you're targeted. That's the difference. And so, but yet in their, in their being targeted or persecuted, or in their regular, the anxiety of events, troubling, or the burdens that they bore, they endured. They remained faithful underneath that. So, under the subpoints there, I, I picked that out and said, wow, these are characteristics of a healthy church. What we've just read in these four verses is a characteristic of a healthy church. The first one is, a healthy church has faithful ministers who are committed to that local church. And that would be Silas, Timothy, and Paul right now, right? And uh, we don't know any other name. Like in the Philippian church, it was uh, Epaphroditus, you know, and so on. You, but you're gonna, if you're going to have a local church, if it's going to be healthy, you've got to have a pastor teacher. You've got to have someone committed. So that's the first thing, faithful ministers committed to the local church. Then secondly there, it's number, it's number three under there, a firm foundation in God and in Christ. That's positional truth. 
as our position. What is our position? Are we in Adam or are we in Christ? If you're in Adam, you're unsaved. If you're in Christ, you're saved, right? And so positional truth is we're in God. We're in Jesus Christ. And so they had a foundation. No other foundation can any man lay than that which has already been laid, right? Paul said that in Corinthians. And that laid, that foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And those are foundational truths of redemption. He mentioned the blood of Christ. All those things. And that's our foundation. Our foundation is in God and in Christ, what God has done in His Son. And then the next one is knowing the, gra- knowing the grace and peace of God. And I call that grace orientation and the resultant peace. It's not peace with God. It's the peace of God. Now being saved is the peace with God. You know, you can't make peace with God. He's already made that peace. You have to, re- you have to receive it. That's what reconciliation is, is when you receive the peace that he's already made through his peace child, Jesus Christ. But the peace of God is that which comes uh, to you in the Christian life, where you enjoy the peace of God against the calamities of the world or the things that would uh, cause you to lose heart. Because people lose heart, they fall apart. But when you have the peace of God, you can walk through some of the dangers that takes place every day for us. And so, grace orientation and then resultant peace. One more thing, I have to say it, without grace orientation, there is no peace. Grace orientation means that you understand it's all of God. Grace means it's all of God. Our salvation is, our, the providence is of God. Uh, everything that's happening now and in the future is of God. He is in control. He has got it. Somebody said, he's got this. He does have it. And uh, he's going to deliver you. He always delivers you out of your tribulations. He always do. He always will. He always has. He always does. He said, I will never leave you, nor never leave you, never forsake you. That's what we have from him. Now, he might lead you through the, the, the dark waters of death. He might deliver you through death or deliver you from death, but he will deliver you. And that's, he's done that with every believer, Old Testament and New. God is faithful who will do it, we're told. He's faithful who will do it. So, so that's, that's grace. We've got to get a hold of grace. The opposite of grace is, look what I do. You know, I, got, I, I, I do this for God. I'm doing this for God. He, he should bless the Lord, here I am. You know, the Pharisees, you know, stood up in the temple and said that. Lord, he, the scripture says he prayed to himself. He didn't get past himself, but he said, Lord, I thank you. Oh, God, I thank you that I'm not like this sinner over here. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And so that's self-righteousness, and that's good works. People uh, are going to heaven with good works, and that's not. And no one's going to heaven with good works. Uh, that's not how we go to heaven. So we'll understand grace. And then their, growth, their faith was growing exceedingly, exceedingly. Uh, have you noticed that in anybody at all? Now, some of you teachers, you know, that maybe taught like you, Lynn, uh, maybe some young people, when you see them really open up and the Lord opens their heart and you see that precious faith at the beginning or maybe a student, you know, or when you were a young person yourself when God enlightened you and opened up your heart to the gospel and you got excited about it. And so how does faith grow? Well, f- faith originates but through the grace of God. Faith originates by hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. But then how does it continue? How does it abound? How do we grow in grace? In in faith. We grow in grace and in faith in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of of Jesus Christ. And so the more we hear, we want to hear the Word. We want to hear, tell me the old old story. Those who know it best seem longing to hear it like the rest. Yeah, and I, I'm serious about that. I want to hear the word, you know, and and we I'd love to hear that old word, and uh, we want to hear it. But you know why? It brings joy. It gives us peace. It brings us joy. It glorifies God. We're we, we're excited about that because that is the, the, what God has given to us. He's blessed us with so much, and we get to know it. We get to discover what that is, and how wonderful their faith was growing. You see it. How do you know that? You can see it. You know, it, it was John Piper, and you know, he's a, he's a covenant theologian. Yeah. 
He's got the eschaton all messed up, but anyway, <laughs> I really like it. I read it, you know, I read his devotions all the time, and I really like, he really does a good job of Paul's epistles. And, uh, you know, he said this, he said, he said this, he said, and I'm almost quoting it exactly. He said, so, okay, so you've made decisions for God, but you don't delight in God. He says, why do you think you're saved? Mm -hmm. That's good. You know? It's not about our decisions for God. Do you delight in God? Do you delight in His Word? What else do we have for our faith? How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent Word. We don't have anything else. We have the Word and we have the Spirit of God. And the ministry of the Spirit on the one hand, the ministry of the Word, and that combines to bring us faith. And that brings us all the benefits of that, the joy, the peace, all the, and the hope. And, he, and here's the point about this. He talked about in this verse here, their faith, right there, their faith, and he talked about them having uh, their faith and their uh, love, faith, love, faith, love, and what's usually after that? Faith, love, and what? Hope. And he, he never mentions their hope because they don't have it. Because, see, somebody's messed their hope up. The hope has to do with the Lord coming again and you waiting on Him. The hope, the blessed hope, is the rapture. The blessed hope. There it is over there. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. That's the rapture. The blessed hope is the appearing of the Lord. And we're told as believers to wait on Him. Wait on Him. Wait on Him. The Thessalonians in Second. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, they were waiting for the Son, for the Son of God from heaven. That's a, that's a good thing to be doing. Waiting on Him. That takes your eyes off the things of the world. The things of the world grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. Okay, So, you know, there it is. So somebody had messed with their hope. And I'm telling you, we need this hope and we don't get it a lot today. The preaching is more like now and now, how do we handle this? You know, and, and all this thing about being patient and loving people and doing this and doing that. But where's the hope? And the hope is always eschatological. That's the first thing the Lord told them. That's the first thing that was told them when He ascended. What did the angel say to the apostles? This same Jesus is taken up from you today will likewise come again, as you see Him taken up. He's coming again. The last word in the book of Revelation is come Lord, come Lord quickly, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. You know, and then we're as, as in the church age, that's what we're looking for too. The eschatological uh, passages in the church age is first and second Thessalonians. That if you want to get you know the eschatolo eschatological stuff is the end time thing. If you want to get the end time thing of the church age, it's gonna be Thessalonians chapter uh, chap first Thessalonians, second chapter. Thessalonians to help you with that. But we need to preach that hope. Jesus is coming again. And we need to preach that. Our young people need to have that. They need to know that. They don't. I don't mean our particular church. I don't want to, I'm not despairing anything. But I'm talking about all the young people I see and have talked with. They just, you know, it's just the, the, the truth is not there. Our pastors need to pound this and pound this and pound this. Because, you know, we have said it so many times. In Hebrews it said of Jesus, for the joy set before Him, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross. The joy set before Him is this over here. How He was going to bring sons into the kingdom of God. The children of God that was going to be His heritage. He had a joy set before Him that enabled Him to endure the suffering. And so that hope helps us to endure whatever has been laid on us, whatever tribulation. We can, we, we're going to move through it. God's able to, to rescue us in it or to bring us through it or sustain us in it as long as we know that He's moving us towards something far better. And Paul said it like this, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Isn't that good? <laughs> That's just got to be good. <laughs> it is good. All right. Beautiful. All right. So they endured... Trials. So that's the you know characteristics of a beautiful uh, of a healthy church. Ministers who are committed. We got to have great pastors. 
a foundation in God and Christ, those fundamental truths, grace and peace of God, the peace of God in that congregation. I don't know, you visit a lot of churches, Brother Patterson, and I, I know you can tell whether the love of God's there, the peace of God. When I've been able to go and visit, you could tell how you would be greeted, whether the love of God's there or the peace of God, or whether you could cut the <laughs> stress. The stress was pretty great. And so we want that. That's a healthy situation. Grace and peace. The, the faith is growing. You see people's faith. They sing about it. Uh, you know, when you have true faith, you can sing. You know, you can get up there and just go ahead and sing. You know, you don't have to sound pretty. You just get up and sing. <laughs> you know, and I tell you, I keep saying this. I've been blessed the last few months, a few, a few weeks ago. We say there's victory in Jesus out here on Sunday morning. And the roof almost went off. <laughs> you know, because you're talking about my faith. And so I'm going to, when, I, when it touches my faith, I'm going to show that I believe that. You know? All right? And so, okay, now, move on down to the next section. A promise to the ones who suffer. Now, this may be a little difficult for you, but let me read it, and then we'll talk about it. He says, which is, verse 5, which is. Now, he's talking, what's the which is? That's the persecution they were under. The, they were enduring persecution. He says, this enduring of persecution is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that, or so that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you also suffer. Let me stop there just for a moment. What he's saying is you're suffering, but you're enduring. The Lord is with you. Your faith is growing. You have love for one another. You experience the peace of God even in persecution. He says that's a token. That's a token that God is bringing you through and that's a token that He is enabling you to walk and He's developing holiness in you or it's a holy walk or a walk worthy of your calling. So that's what He's saying and He's saying your suffering is because of, 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 of Him. <coughs> he says for the kingdom of God. He says for which indeed you also suffer. You are suffering for the kingdom of God. Remember Jesus talked about it. He said, if you suffer for my sake, you know, a lot of our suffering is deserved. A lot of my suffering been deserved. I deserved it. I got what, you know, I, I deserved. But when you suffer for the sake of Jesus, it's undeserved suffering. It's undeserved. You're suffering because of him. And, uh, and that's what Paul suffered so many things himself. He has a list of all the things. He wasn't bragging about his suffering. He was glorifying, glorying in the fact that the Lord had delivered him through shipwreck, through beatings, you know, through death, all those things. He wasn't bragging and said, look at me, you feel sorry for me, oh me. No, he was just glorifying in the fact that the Lord's been faithful and he's faithful to deliver you. Uh, verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now that's the comfort. He's saying, look, they're, they're targeting you for persecution, but God's righteousness will one day turn on them. They're going to pay the recompense of what they're doing. So Paul lets them know that they have some, verse 7, and to you, see in other words, verse 6, the God's righteous. Uh, justice of God recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and then verse 7 and to you who are troubled what does God give? He gives you rest he, he gives you rest along with us Paul says Timothy and, and Paul and Silas we have rest in him he says when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and so, so basically <laughs> let me show you what that maybe looks like here Here's the Lord coming back with his mighty angels right here. And what happens is, there is, this is where they pay. This is where the payday is. Payday someday, R.G. Lee, right there. But over here, the rapture's taking place, so the, the body of Christ is at rest. The body of Christ is at rest. You don't think the body of Christ is going to be here to, to pay. The body of Christ has been given rest. 
And then over here, tribulation and trouble coming right here. And that's what that verse is saying. Let's look at the sub points. Uh, uh, their sufferings were an evident token of proof or evidence of the righteous decision of God. And that sub point one means God chose the suffering for them. You say, oh, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. God chose the suffering that they would walk through. That's what this says. And what did, what did Paul say to Timothy? Those who would live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Shall suffer persecution. God chooses that for us to walk. If he gave you everything you wanted and just feathered your nest, you'd think you'd, you'd be a little old baby believer squawking about everything that was discomforting to you. But if you walk through the fire and you see that he's able and you discover his peace and his presence in all that pain, the valleys of life, the valley of tears, you know, the valley of death, then you, you, that's how your faith grows. You know, that's how the word of God becomes real to you in your experience. And so the Lord chose that. That's his decision. It's his decision how much you suffer. If you suffer now, you don't suffer later. Well, not, in the, not once after the rapture. There's no more tears, no more sorrows, no more suffering then. Number two there. Through sufferings, these believers gained a worthy walk. You know, they were faithful to their calling. They're, they're, uh, they were worthy of the kingdom of God. They suffered indeed for the kingdom of God. And so the principle is this. Uh, that's number three there, sub point three. The principle is this. The believer in Christ will suffer. And I gave you those scriptures, and I wanted to read those, but I don't have time to read them. But I hope you'll read every one of those. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 11 through 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. The principle is believers suffer because they're in the body of Christ. There's some suffering in the body of Christ. Remember when Paul says, I want to know him in the power of the resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If the Lord brings you into conformity to the death of the cross, then you're going to suffer. You'll, but you enter into the fellowship of his suffering. And that's what he's talking about there. Look it up. Uh, number four there, God's righteous judgment will bring a recompense upon those who did cause their suffering. That's verse 6. And then flip the page, number five. We're going to my outline. Number five, where he says, manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. In other words, in other words, our patient endurance, in other words, what you're going through, your patient endurance, even when other people are persecuting us, is a token. It shows that we believe that there will come a day when God will judge those who persecute us. When people persecute believers, we do not have to strike back because God will take care of it in His own time. Amen. Remember He said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. So what am I doing trying to get even? Remember I told you the other day I had a, a deacon, I don't mean to pick on deacons, but he was a deacon, and he said to me, I don't forgive, I get even. And I asked y'all the other night, did anybody ever heard that? You know, a lot of people heard it. You've heard it before. That's not a good way to live, is it? To live with that kind of bitterness and anger and wrath. That has to be let go. And it's let go, let, you let that go through forgiveness. Okay, now let's move on. So God's promise to the suffering saint is twofold. Right here in our passage. First of all, God will repay the persecutors. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, our passage. He says, Recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And then, uh, secondly, God will give rest to his saints. That's verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest. He gives rest to us. It refers to the body of Christ in heaven after the rapture. What are we doing? We're resting here while a lot of stuff's going on here. And a lot of retribution's taking place here. You know, God's wrath is being poured out here. We're resting. It's the only way it could ever be because we're members of the body of Christ. 
And Jesus hanging on the cross took the wrath of God. And it's all over. He says, it's finished. So if you're in Him, you're not going under that wrath again. It's over. It was finished. He suffered for us. He suffered in our place. All right, so who's going to suffer? All right, so look at the next, the basis of this comfort. Verse 8. So when he comes, he says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance, there it is, on them that know not God, that's the first thing, know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony was believed among you in that day. Now, Let's look at our subpoint because we'll get through on time. Subpoint one. It is at the second advent of Jesus Christ, which is verse 10, that the judgment will be brought upon the unbelieving. This, com- this condemnation is because of two things. Rejection of the knowledge of God. I give it as an example, Romans 1, verses 18 through 21, which says, when they knew God, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. So there's a knowledge of God that's rejected. They would not have the knowledge of God in them. In their minds, they would not retain the knowledge of God. So God turned their mind over to a reprobate mind. A mind that he could not approve of. And then refusal to obey the gospel. Well, you know, a lot of, you can write a commentary on that. What does it mean to obey the gospel? Uh, don't, don't give me all this work stuff. Obeying the gospel in this dispensation is do you believe in Jesus Christ? You know, God's declared the gospel to us that he died for our sins, was buried, rose again. You know, do you believe that? Is that what you're trusting for your salvation? And in that sense, you've responded. You've surrendered to that truth. You know, I surrender to that truth. And that's uh, part of, uh, that's, that's the idea of obedience. Now, some commentators would take it further to say, okay, no, it means the obedience over in here because the, 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 the destruction's coming here for those who don't obey in here, and I agree. Uh, if you put it in context, their, their destruction, and eternal fire right here, their destruction is to those who don't obey the gospel here. They don't want the knowledge of God, they don't want to obey the gospel here. What's the gospel in the tribulation? Repent, and, and if you read the book of Revelation, they refuse to repent. And the, and the everlasting gospel preached by the angels said, Repent and give glory to the one who created the heavens and the earth. And they refuse to give God glory for being the creator. They refuse to repent of anything. And even though they were headed for total destruction, they would they disobeyed the gospel, see? The gospel in the tribulation is different than what we preach today. But it, no, it's always of God now. Don't get it wrong. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That goes way back. And so anybody that's ever been saved has been by grace, but never by works. But there's a different way of presenting itself because of the urgency of the moment. You know, if the Lord was about to come back tomorrow uh, at, at the second advent and everything was going to burn, there was going to be uh, destruction and, and souls were going into the lake of fire forever and ever, wouldn't you want to, somebody to notify you that tomorrow something's going to happen here? They're going to be notified all along in here that this is coming, this is coming, this is coming. You know, and it is. If you read the book of Revelation, you see it. That's, that's, what, that's how it's brought out. Now, quickly. So the knowledge, they, they rejected knowledge of God. That'd be like God consciousness. We don't want him. And then refusal to obey the gospels. Whatever that message is being delivered to them, they reject it. And then, and then number three there, those who persecuted the Thessalonians belonged to this group of people. In other words, they were like these people. They targeted believers. They rejected knowledge of God. They rejected the gospel. And then number four there, Revelation 14, 11, Revelation 20, verses 10 through 5, Revelation, uh, Matthew 25, 41. It shows how the unbeliever will be dismissed from the presence of God into the lake of fire. And, and it says eternal. Eternal destruction. Now some people teach annihilation. You know, that would be wonderful if it was just annihilation, but the Bible does not teach that. I, I, I don't think, now a lot of theologians t- teach that. Progressive Christianity teaches there's no hell. <laughs> you know, so you got, so you got to go, go progressive or go back to the old way, the old paths. 
the old, old gospel. The word of God says eternal dismissal from the presence of God into the lake of fire. All right, then number five, five there, I put this. Heaven and hell are real. And, and only through faith in Christ can the sinner escape hell and gain heaven. Amen. And then number six, in this dispensation of grace, it is faith alone which applies the salvation that Christ has already provided. In Romans 4, it says this, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Number seven, when Christ comes at the end of the great tribulation, at the second advent, he will be glorified in his saints. That's the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7 uh, says, you know, I think I got time to look at that just real quick. Ephesians uh, chapter 2 verse 7 is a really important principle there. Ephesians 2 7. There it is. Listen to this. You know, Paul says this, and we never catch these things, but listen to this. He says of, of Jesus, well, I'll, I'll go to verse 6 first. Is, and he raised, we were raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So you know what those tribulational saints are admiring? It says that he'll be admired right here. These saints in the, that came through, the true believers in the tribulation, they're going to admire, admire what God has done in His grace through those saints that apparently who's going to be coming back with Him. He took somebody that had no covenant, who had no hope, who was dead in trespasses and sin, and look what He's going to do with you. And, and, and other believers will admire that because these believers are not members of the body of Christ. They, they're, they're being given the earth. We have been given heaven. They, they receive the earth. Where's our heaven and where's our citizenship? Come on, come on. Our citizenship is where? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where have we been blessed? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Where? In heavenly places. But you see these people on the earth, they're going to admire what God has done through the body of Christ. Because that's going to be displayed one day. Right now it's a secret to the world. The world does not see it. We have influence in the world. The body of Christ does. The Holy Spirit is a restraining power in the world to keep away the wickedness that's going to come. But yet it will not be manifested until that time. One day it will be manifested. God's not going to keep it a secret. And one day it will be manifested. Think about it. The body of Christ will be manifested in all the glory. And so He is glorified in us and we are are glorified in Him. That's what he says here in this next passage. So, okay, there it is. Um, about to forget where I am. Number seven, when Christ comes at the end of the tribulation, at the second advent, He will be glorified. There it is. He will be glorified in His saints, the body of Christ. That's Ephesians 2, 7. And He will be admired. He will be admired in all of them that believe in that day. That day. What day? The ones who will be believers when Christ returns to the, at the end of the tribulation. That's the ones who are going to admire what God has done in His body, the body of Christ that will be manifested. And so you have kingdom saints over here, and you have, these are saints too. We're saints. There's, there's tribulational saints, people who live through the tribulation. Those who are resurrected and go into the kingdom, they're kingdom saints. Rightly divide the word. There's two different things there. Okay, now the last part will be through. Intercession for the church. Now Paul prays for the church. He's already told him he's prayed for him and told him why he was praying for him and talking about him and bragging on him. Now he prays for the church and he says, wherefore? In other words, to this end. To this end means to realize what we've just seen in verses 8 and 9. To this end, he says, also we pray always for you that, he, this is a purpose clause here, that our God should count you worthy of this, of, his, of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. That, and that's the result clause, 
with the result that, or so that, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be, mag may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So quickly, let's look at that, that last section under this. This is beautiful. I mean, you could spend the whole morning teaching on this. Just that one verse. You teachers. Faith is manifested by good works. The result is that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified in the believer. This glory is always in Him. This represents the believer's union with Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That's how we get into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit actually puts us into the body of Christ. And uh, number four, also Paul is praying that the Lord himself would be glorified in each believer's worthy walk. The worthy walk, it reminds me of Ephesians chapter four, where he says, I beseech you, uh, brethren, or whatever. He says that you walk worthy of the, of the vocation where we, where, where, wherewith you are called. A worthy walk. He asks us to work to walk worthy of what we've been placed in too. You know, if I have if I've been placed into Christ, I should seek to walk in Him, in newness of life, putting off the corruption, and uh, you know, and having to do with our speech as well as our conduct. He talks about that in Ephesians chapter four, but here we have the worthy walk, and then number five there. How is it that we can fulfill all goodness? or fulfill our calling as Christians? That's a great question. How is it that we can fulfill all goodness at, or fulfill our calling as Christians? And the principle is found in Ephesians 5, 9. And here's what Paul said. He said this, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all, there's the word, is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit of the Spirit is, is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And then we're reminded of Galatians chapter 5, right? Verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, all those things, including truth or faith. And so how can we fulfill the goodness of God? He says that you, he prays that you will fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. How can we do that? And the answer is that's the Holy Spirit's work in us as we respond to the word hearing the word. Our faith's got to grow and then the Spirit will begin to move about in our life producing in us the, the goodness that he's talking about here. To fulfill all goodness or this goodness. And then the last point, so it is always by means of grace. So he ends, the, he ends this section on the words according. See that? According to, this, according to the norm and the standard according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I put down there three things real quick. It's by grace that we're saved. It's by grace that we serve. It's, it's by grace that we have that goodness. It's by grace that we endure the tribulations. There it is. Thank you all very much. Thank you. You got it through. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right. Lee, would you please? Father, we thank you for this time, God, that Lord, we can come out, Lord, on a Wednesday night, Father, and just, Lord, hear your word, Father, brought to us by Brother Tommy, God. We thank you for his knowledge of your word, God, and we just thank you for his ability to deliver it to us, Father, uh, that you can speak through him to us, Father. Lord, may we take this word, Father, and dwell on it this week, God, and let it change us, and Lord, may we be more like you each and every day, Father. We love you and thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.